Hello. Today we're going to take a further look at Aristotle's conception of substance. We've encountered substance in Aristotle's categories, also in the physics, through his presentation of the four causes. Recall again that Aristotle's account of causality is something very different than the way we would typically conceive of causality today, or the way that you think about cause and effect when you're looking at causes and effects, say, in the physics lab. For Aristotle, a cause is not primarily something intended to explain how something happens, not intended to explain the stimulus for an event. It's a way of explaining what something is, uh, the, things that, the reasons why something exists as the thing that it exists as. So not how something happens, but what something is. So the focus for causality for Aristotle is again squarely on this conception of substance. Now Aristotle says that substances can be conceived of as composites, in particular as composites of matter and form. So we've encountered this already in his account of causality, the material cause and the formal cause, the first two causes that he elaborates in this conception. All substances can, can be understood as composites of matter and form. And uh, this is something that applies to every natural substance. It applies to every substance that there is, with the exception, perhaps, of God. Aristotle's God, which we will get to, you can conceive of, perhaps, as a kind of a substance, but one that is form only with no matter, because God is pure actuality for Aristotle, pure activity. But the ordinary types of substances that we encounter in the day-to-day -day world, uh, this horse, this particular human being, this dog Fido, all of those things are understood as composites of matter and form. They're material and they ha that matter has some particular form. Now, it's important to understand, too, that while this is a composite, you know, what we think of as composite is something that's joined of different things. We also think of us uh, as being able to separate those things into their component parts. But the, in this case, the component parts are things that can be separated only conceptually. So we can distinguish the matter from the form of a substance in our minds but we can't simply separate them. And this is the reason why for Aristotle there doesn't actually exist anything that we could call prime matter, stuff that is just matter and nothing else. Every matter, every kind of matter that exists already has some kind of form. Now that form can be changed one of Aristotle's favorite examples, again, is the bronze statue or the bronze sphere. And there it's fairly easy to distinguish in the mind what's matter from what's form. The sphere is made of a particular material, a particular metal, bronze, and that metal has a particular shape. It's spherical in nature. So it's got matter, the bronze, and it's got form, the sphere. Now we can't just ha take that sphere out of the bronze, okay? We can separate it in our mind. We can have an idea of a sphere. We can mathematically define it. But we can't take that sphere away from the bronze and uh, have a sphere that has no matter, have an actual sphere that doesn't have any matter whatsoever. So too, we can't take the matter away from the form and have something that's just matter with no form. Now we could melt that sphere down, of course, and uh, then it would have a different shape. So we could destroy the, the bronze sphere. It could no longer be a sphere, but it would have some other shape. No matter what shape we put it into, however, the matter is still going to have some form. And indeed, just as bronze, it's going to have a particular form, a particular constitution that bronze doesn't share with gold or platinum or straw, or mud, or some other material stuff. So matter always comes with some form, and a substance is a composite of matter plus form. 
Now another thing to notice about this notion of a substance as composite of matter plus form is that this notion of substance, this concept of substance, gives Aristotle his way of responding to the challenges posed by the thought of Heraclitus and Parmenides, especially as we saw it presented by Plato. His own way to answer what we saw as the one-many problem, in particular the challenge of explaining identity through change. In order to have an explanation of change, we have to have an understanding of how things can remain identical. Because if, as for Heraclitus, everything is always changing in every respect and there is no stability whatsoever, then it doesn't even make sense to talk about a thing changing. Because from one instant to the next, that thing is no longer the thing that it was. So Aristotle's notion of substance is his explanation of what we might call the thinginess you know, or the thisness of the thing that can still undergo changes. So if we take a particular individual human being, such as Socrates, Socrates is born, lives his life in ancient Athens, dies when he is executed, but as long as he is alive, Socrates is Socrates. He's the same individual person in, so in Aristotle's view. And throughout his life, Socrates goes through many changes. He grows, uh, he takes in nourishment, he gets new cells, sheds old cells, gets old, uh, his hair may change color, it may fall out, he learns things, knows things that he didn't know before, he might be in the agora, he might be in the gymnasium, so he's in different places. All kinds of things change about Socrates, but something about Socrates it doesn't change. And that's the Socratesness of Socrates, which only he, Socrates, has. So behind this notion, right, substance, if you remember from the category, substance can remain the same and yet take on opposite qualities. Right? So a substance can be cold at one time, hot at another time, cold at another time, and remain the same thing. It's still the same substance. So these properties that can change about a substance, they don't change the identity of a substance. Socrates, according to tradition, was a terribly ugly fellow with a uh, ugly nose and eyes that bugged out, right? So suppose we take our ugly Socrates uh, to the beauty parlor. We get him done up, maybe some plastic surgery, Botox treatments, make him into beautiful Socrates. He's still Socrates. The changes have just been accidental changes. Nothing has changed about the nature of Socrates in and of himself. So some aspects of a substance's form are things that are accidents. In other words, they are qualities that that substance has, but that are not definitive of what that substance is. And those can change and come and go without changing the identity of the substance itself. So too, the material aspects of a substance are things that can change. So that certainly doesn't define what a substance is, is the material of the substance. Uh, so if Socrates um, gets those Botox uh, treatments and plastic surgery and has some physical changes, uh, if he dyes his hair and that changes color or gets a hair cut, he's still the same Socrates. So a change in matter, or if hairs fall out and new hairs grow in, a change in matter doesn't change the identity of the individual. So there's something about uh, this individual Socrates and every other individual su uh, substance that makes that substance the particular thing that it is and not another thing. What is that? Well, that's a little bit difficult to pinpoint, but it is an aspect of the form of the substance. It's the essence of the thing. So every substance has an essence which makes it what it is and gives it its identity that it can retain through different, uh, uh, through all different kinds of 
changes and situations. And this is uh, an important aspect of what, Soc of what Aristotle wants to do with this concept of substance.